Okay, we are in the home stretch now. This is our last session, and really what we want to do is to kind of uh, reflect back on what we've discussed the past two days and um, you know, come up with some key messages, what we heard, and th talk about you know, how are we going to disseminate those key messages. What did we learn? What are the key messages? How do we take that message forward? What will we do differently as a result of these past two days? So, um, Clarion, anything you want to add to it? Um, the, only thing I would, the only thing I would add to it is this. Um, are you capable now of maybe figuring out who else should be added to the table when you have a meeting or who shouldn't be at the table? But again, that would be the one thing I would think that this sort of an environment with all the, all the players we've had might give you some more insight into who should be helping or who should be participating. Great. So why don't we start with um, thinking about key messages? Um, I'll start with one just to get us, um, uh, you know, get us going. So one of the biggest takeaways uh, for me personally was hearing um, success stories and reflecting back on the fact that when you have a partnership that creates impact and it leads to success, it creates this virtuous cycle. And second was that we have to share many stories. Of, so there are good stories to be shared. Um, and how do we share those stories? And how do we not make it seem as though there is, this continues to be an um, you know, endless challenge all the time? Because there are models out there. There are innovative models. In fact, we heard a few this, just this morning. We heard a few yesterday where things actually are working and are scalable and can be sustainable. So, so for me, that uh, and then the issue of trust. Trusting uh, each other, uh, I think, um, you know, creating that environment of trust, but all in it together was another key message. Uh, but that the common goal that we all have, which binds us all together, is the goal of saving lives and improving lives. So, Clarion, any reflections from you? Um, again, I just, every panel sort of brought me to another level. Um, I hate to do this again, but Amanda, who give, was giving us this great talk this morning, she just stopped mid-sentence and said, by the way, there was, a set, there was an area that didn't work for me, and just shared that same tone, uh, didn't whip herself about it, but said, this is what happens. Uh, so I really felt that the honesty w which, which occurred in this room was unique and should be sought in any environment we're in. But I, I have to thank everyone for, for being uh, of that manner and that ilk. So that's what, that's what I thought made this really work. All right. So let's see. Anybody want to share a key message? Brenda? So I'll, I'll actually mention two that, that struck with me. I think one was sort of this refrain throughout the day and a half about um, <coughs> unnecessary bias and going into things. It relates to the trust issue, but going into things with preconceptions about either a particular organization, something an organization is doing, and how important it is to really educate yourself and have the conversation and get past those obstacles to find ways to potentially work together. And then second, um, I think we keep hearing about the challenge of sustainability um, and integration into into um, the government or the community. So I think there's still, what I took away is there's still a lot of work to be done in the sustainability space. Thanks. Thanks, Brenda. Jessica? Um, a message that I heard recurring throughout the last couple days, including in your panel yesterday, and I think Brenda verbalized it very well, is that value has many different forms. And um, it, it, we're talking about saving lives, but it can also be about enhancing the mission. It can be about forming new relationships, um, learning how to trust, um, going into new markets, learning from your partners, et cetera. Thank you. 
Anybody else? Yes. Well, thanks for a great meeting. This is my first time attending one of these, and sort of as a, a newbie, um, I just had an observation that I talked to a couple of people about yesterday, which is great discussion, but it kind of does sound like we're preaching to the converted here, and just thinking about how to kind of take this forward in a, a bigger, more impactful way. I'm wondering if um, the forum could support an effort to publish more uh, research and case studies of these different partnerships so that we can start to get out to a bigger audience, sort of what works, lessons learned, best practices, those kinds of things. Yeah, I, I think that is um, one of the key, key um, themes that we've heard again and again is that uh, what happened here at the National Academy at the Keck Center should not just stay here, that we should just take it forward. But the, key, the question is, who is the audience? And how do we get to that audience? And what's the right venue? Is publishing reports the best way? I, you know, I, maybe so for certain audiences. But many other audiences are looking for information in other ways. Um, and so that's another thing for us to think about and consider as well. Yes. Um, just picking up on that theme also yesterday of the brokers of um, kind of the bridges between whether they're sectors or whether they're within a company. We heard about the liaison within a big company to help communicate different aspects to one another. I think um, there's something to be said for just taking on that responsibility. Not everybody's going to be willing to play that role. Not everybody's got the uh, patience to learn an yet another language, like talking to Sean about how I can learn the language of IT, but I need to if I'm going to be working in Silicon Valley. But I think that's a really important takeaway for us um, to continue to just assume that is our mandate, to be that broker, whether it's mul between sectors or even within our own organizations. Great. Thanks, Clarence. Uh, Scott Ratson. Uh, I've been thinking back from the beginning of this with um, Peter Singer's uh, kickoff when you asked a great question of what keeps you up at night, and he said ideology, and um, gave a good explanation. And I think we've seen ideology here, uh, which is fine, right? Brian gave a different point of view from his work, uh, and that's valuable. So how do we continue to increase in the evidence-based approach that we live in, the science-based world? How do we have valid and reliable information that we know that these partnerships are working or not? Sometimes we've heard PPP, and when I wear my academic hat, PPAP. We want to always have an academic partner needs to be there on the ground, local leadership, <laughs> local, cultural, you know, all these other pieces, which is, which is important. But how does that get funded? How does that have its resource? If it's resourced from the same funder that's doing the program, some people don't trust it. Absolutely. So how can we create, I think there was a good idea with brokering or other areas, to have this measurement, this evaluation, this assessment, that diffuses the information, much like Gail just said, in a way that people believe it and people make policy decisions and future investments based upon it. I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And that then changes or reinforces ideology, whichever side of the half the evidence falls on. But doing that is much more difficult uh, than just a proclamation, and it's not going to just make, make a peer-reviewed article either. So I don't, I don't have an answer other than I think that that's something that is something that people in this room and others should think about, and not to have barriers that if it's reviewed or assessed that say, no, that's because that's funded by industry, it doesn't count, or just because that PBS or show is sponsored by a certain company, it doesn't count. It's information. It might not be the evidence, but how do we get at that? So I just think it's something we need to continue to, to think about. I mean, Amanda's idea of how do we get programs, or not idea, the, the work that, that's all these programs, how do we apply that to other areas as well? So um, I think there's a lot that came on the table here today, and I commend both of you for the organization and, and leading it. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead. No, I, um, I, I think I resonate with everything folks have said. Uh, um, I guess one, one takeaway for me is the... Uh, the value proposition has a lot of different components, 
for each of the different kinds of sectors and organizations involved. And there really is no common currency, so that's why I think this is hard stuff. Um, two is I, I do think the brokering notion is a really interesting one because it, it suggests that there's a, um, th there's a way to find that alignment. Um, but I, uh, I, I don't know... I don't know if the forum can play that role. It would be terrific if it could, but it would, at a minimum, it would be great to be an advocate for more brokering being done in the real world. And then the last thing is, I, I keep thinking that underlying a lot of the conversation is this sense that partnerships are not ends, they're a means to something we're trying to accomplish. And uh, we're still struggling with the idea, is this means, the means of partnering, the most efficient and effective way to get done what needs to get done? And there may be no great way to answer that third point, but um, I think we're all, at least I, I shouldn't say we all, I've, I'm still struggling with that at times. How do you measure that? First, to, to second uh, what, what John is uh, saying, that the brokering liaison health diplomacy function, there I would advocate for much more capacity building. Because basically you, you can't organize, you can't impose, but you can get more people who have that skill set and that motivation to, to do so. So I think there, the push for capacity building on that would, would certainly be uh, important. Then for me, it was interesting to observe across the two days that we have a tendency of seeing problems where there are none, often based on ideology. Because of the positive spin of the discussion, we didn't discuss much of not seeing the problems where they are that somebody is not willing or shouldn't be in a partnership or how they should be set up. And I think we need all to learn more to get rid of those ideological seeing problems where they aren't, but to keep our eyes open to say, look, this partner could, but is not willing, so let's not try. Or this partner shouldn't be in that partnership because of the nature of it to, to, be, to get smarter on that. Yeah, but it's so it's the it's the partner, but it's also the outcomes, right? So maybe it's a great partnership and everybody's getting along and it's the best partnership ever, but if the if the partnership is not, you know, reaching outcomes, uh, delivering outcomes that are positively impacting health, then it, that's also an issue. But good good points, and I think the the point about that Scott made about evidence, I think, is really important because. At this point, what all we have are anecdotes of what works and what didn't work and stories, right? We, what we don't have is real, you know, longitudinal data and evidence to show, you know, but, but who owns that? Who is responsible for that, right? Has to be an independent party that's not one of the P's or the A. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes. Yep. So just to throw out an idea, um, when you're brokering partnerships, I know we're talking about who can bring what to the table, but what about those beneficiaries, those recipients? They're not at the table. They're not part of the discussion. And I think bringing, and this kind of goes back to the messaging and telling the story, they ultimately are the ones impacted. So those health workers who are able to use a digital system, which saves them a lot of time so they can treat patients more efficiently and faster, that's the story. Um, so being able to bring some of those beneficiaries of the great work we're doing to the table in some way, uh, I think would, would influence and inform a lot of the way we're going about things. Thank you. Two points I'd like to make. First of all, the, the case studies that have been presented here, the, the one overwhelming thing is that extraordinary things have been achieved, and n none of that would have happened without the partnership. Each on its entity on its own would never have been able to do it. It's the partnership that delivered the, the innovation and, and the advances. Uh, it, it's clear partnerships are difficult. <laughs> they really require a lot of work to, to get them going and to keep them going and sustainability and all of that. I, I just want to commend you on this forum. <laughs> uh, it has been such a privilege to sit here with all these people and share, discuss ideas, hear about problems, think about new things. Uh, it's an incredible forum for, for learning and Im improving. 
So I, I really would encourage you to keep this going and even broaden the base of it because I, I'm, I'm certain that these partnerships are, are, are improving health for all and are, are a critical part of getting to SDG3. So thank you very much. Thank you. That's great to hear. One, 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 I just want to interrupt mm -hmm. for a second. I'm working with Gail uh, back there on a health literacy thing. Can you talk just a few moments about where health literacy stands and where we might be able to engage others better? Sure. Um, and just to go back to the, the evidence point, I, I think Scott articulated it better than I did, but I really do feel like we need a combination of data sets here to really get us to the next phase. We need those longer studies with the metrics to show the actual impacts and outcomes. We need case studies to show the partnership models and the roles of all these different entities. We need best practices and lessons learned. We need to talk about the failures and what didn't work, as, as Amanda did. So um, I think there's a number of audiences and different kinds of products that would really help us get these messages out to a wider audience and create more shared value across lots of other untapped markets and sectors. Um, right now, it's a pretty limited scope of who's you know, around the table in these things. And there's, I think, great potential to go bigger. Um, on the health literacy point, um, again, it kind of builds on what Amanda just said about you got to go back to the audience here and the people that we're trying to help, right? So um, in order for people to understand health conditions, in order for them to understand how to access products and services, um, they need health literacy tools. They need to be able to understand medical information that's in very direct and simple terms. Um, I do a lot of behavior change campaigns for health. And what I always find, no matter where I go, is that medical people just want to um, overwhelm the audience with really technical information. And it's not at all the, either the content that they need, it's not in the format that they need, it's way too much, they can't retain it all. So we need to always be designing from the people that we're trying to help. And so um, just kind of a, a call to keep that in mind as these partnerships continue to form. Um, you need to have the sort of the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the audience in mind as you're designing these partnerships. Thank you. Bad doctor. Bad doctor. <laughs> Bruce? Uh, being a rookie, uh, first time here, I, I, I just also want to commend the folks. It's a great forum for learning. What I also want to, I think, point out, which is pretty obvious, is that the, the, the growth and the, the ability to partner and to create these kinds of partnership is also trending at the same level as the improvements that we're seeing in global health. And I don't think there is, you know, a causality, okay, but yet there is a real deep, um, I think, correlation between the improvements we're seeing and the ability to partner. It goes back to the, I think we do need some more capacity in the brokering space to build these better partnerships. So I, that's the first point. The second is, when I listen to your language, and I, so I am hesitating just to get your attention. You have too much hesitation. You have too much self-reflection going on. If you go back to the folks who really want to make the, the health outcomes differences in their lives, get on with it, right? Move these things forward. We're gonna make some mistakes. We're not gonna be perfect. We're gonna, right? And then lastly, Massive change is happening in the consumer place. They have more information, they're managing their health better, they're absolutely having more knowledge, they're driving their behaviors to whether it's product, services, whatever. It is moving rapidly and it's moving rapidly. I just got back from deep DRC and I'll tell you what, it, they too have amazing knowledge now in a space where they understand it and are acting upon it. So it's moving everywhere. So. We're going to have a different landscape um, in four or five years, ten years, where these partnerships need to align itself with the consumer, with the, those folks who we want to see. So it, that is going to be a very different space. We need to anticipate that as a partnering, uh, brokering space. Thank you, Bruce. Can I maybe shift the discussion a little bit? One more person. Andy to, wanted to say something? Yeah. Mm -hmm.
points to brokering diplomacy and sustainability. Brokering diplomacy speaks to, in fact, needing to understand all sides. Um, and I think there are additional voices that can be amplified here, certainly the beneficiaries, but the local governments um, should be at the table. Um, and I'll say more of the voice of, of, to use a word that we shouldn't be embarrassed of, the profit centers uh, within private industry. Uh, and not just the CSR window or door into that, but those people that live that life. And this will get to the sustainability question, because I think we touched on this yesterday, there are different time frames in play that are problematic, and there are, is a huge valley of death of taking drones to sustainability, whatever the application. That profit center lives on a three-month quarterly time frame sometimes. That's deadly. That country that is trying to deal with the economic benefits of, of uh, greater health and of health impact, those are decades that they're dealing with of when can we stand up and afford these technologies to invest. How do we bridge that in public-private partnership? Uh, and that has to get the right people at the table and to broker that discussion. And who funds that? What's the economics of funding that? Great. Yes, um, one more comment. And then I also wanted to make sure that we have time to discuss how we're going to share this information, who the audiences are, and uh, you know what's the best way to do it. Through, should it be a published report, more of these forums? What, what else should we be doing? So with that, Jim. So I always look at things a little differently than the rest of the world, and it's a sad little place I live in. So I'm going to try it again here now. When I look at those three practice areas, science, engineering, and medicine, there's one common theme that all of them are dependent on, and that is information. You, do, you lean on it, you demand it, you accept it, but nothing less than having the right information to make all three of those practice areas successful. Yet no one's demanding information in public health. We still allow the fact that no one has any information and we're working off of handwritten books. We're letting governments turn around and continue to say whether there's inventory somewhere or there's not. And I think one of the roles you, you need to consider in this space is how do you help advocate for information? Because you don't need to have three observers and two academics to watch what's, someone's happening. If you have information that compares before and after, you already have your business case built. So it's a chance for us to be able to say, what is our role as, as this academy? And can we help influence information being a critical part of success? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Clarion, shall we shift gears? Yes, please. <laughs> so dissemination. And you know, who are our, our audiences? And I think we talked about this a couple of times. We're talking amongst ourselves. You know. How do we broaden the conversation? How do we reach others? Um, and what are the venues? And you know, what's the best way to uh, disseminate this information? Thoughts? Yes, Amanda. I think we can go home and start internally um, and share with our teams about some of the themes that we've been discussing here, our personal takeaways. And we need to build that capacity within our own organizations to be those brokers, to think about partnerships in a different way, um, and to act on it. So we're not just sitting here, um, you know, twiddling our thumbs, but actually, you know, giving space and giving uh, room to push forward and try and do new and different things and encouraging that. I also think um, working with academic institutions and working with students to give these messages <coughs> forward, um, they're the future. You know, they're going to be coming from business schools, from uh, public health programs uh, into our space. So increasing and strengthening linkages with that group I think would be very important. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I'm Carolyn Moore. I'm with the Global Handwashing Partnership, and I manage a public-private partnership. So my day-to-day -day work is really that that brokering role. And I've learned so much being here today, and then then yesterday online, um, that I think could potentially translate very well to people who are trying to manage some of these partnerships. I think there's a real lack of. Um, just basic guidance sometimes for some of this wisdom. Um, and so thinking back, like if I had some had a checklist that said, make sure you're asking all their partners what they want to gain and what their constraints are and what their time constraints are. Things like that, which might seem pretty simple, I think would have tremendous value for people who are in that brokering role. Great, great point. Yes, guidance. 
think most of our discussions turned around the, the top billion and the bottom billion of the world and totally missed five billion in between. So looking forward that we start to think humanity lives in middle income country and is middle income and is not poor and is not rich. Um, for, for my own takeaway, I realized I was pleasantly surprised that I would say more than 80% of the examples given WHO is one of the partner in one form or another. But we are not good enough in giving an overview because that, that is part of our coordination role and their input from others would also be help, helpful on what kind of overview should, should we be giving because already if we would only we have a, a simple listing, but if we had a good tool where all partnerships WHO is involved with would be accessible, that would give three quarter of the overview of what partnerships in global health there are. So inputs on what we could and how we could address that would be very helpful for us also. Thank you. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> uh, I, there's so much wisdom and wonderful examples here, and, and I think there's so much learnings even from partnerships that didn't work, um, which makes me think that leaving the communications to an ad hoc, maybe we can have conversations when we go back, etc., cetera, is, is leaving too much to chance. And I wondered if there might be a deliberate communications effort, uh, a communication strategy, uh, so to speak, of whether it can be uh, helped out by AAAS, I'm not committing them, or, or a subcommittee of this group forms uh, to say, well, what are those uh, social media communications? What are the best practices tools? Uh, what are the guidelines for partnerships or a checklist, uh, et cetera? Um, but I think it needs to be a bit more deliberate um, in, in thinking through this uh, con strategy. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great point. Yes, Scott. Thank you. Um, I'll answer this um, great question uh, and want to thank Niraj for the uh, idea on communication. So people might not know, but for 24 years I've been editing the Journal of Health Communication, which is a peer-reviewed journal uh, that now comes out monthly and we've, we get a number of submissions. And communication is always an issue. Uh, and when donors often give or begin a lot of these programs, communication is an afterthought, which was ad hoc over here or demonstrative over here. So there could be some recommendations that are made for any project that it has a certain percentage for evaluation, monitoring, assessment, and communication. Uh, so it's not an afterthought and it's not always retrospective. The other piece that I think was really interesting is this idea of innovation of checklists. Uh, we have heard Atul go one day and seen the work that he's done on surgical checklists and there's other checklists, pregnancy checklists and others supported by WHO. Frugal innovation is putting checklists and guidelines and principles and pieces in place that help the processes work. So there are some examples that actually I'm working on with a group at Harvard Kennedy School of multi-sectoral engagement for sustainable health to do some of these. But it needs a whole group of people to add input into this. And how much do we do on paper versus how much do we do electronically or how much do we do intrinsically for the training and the capacity building that, that John Monahan mentioned as well is so important. So. Uh, I think all of this is something that it's great that the Academy does this and the fact that this is webcast and the fact that it's printed and published is one piece, but we have to think in the 21st century uh, and doing this requires um, lots of different thinking and getting out there on social media uh, in a realistic, ongoing way that combats um, some of the mistruths or, or uh, truth decay that we've seen uh, on some of the science and evidence-based approaches. That's great. Rachel, you think any of these ideas, like a, either a, a subgroup that works on a communication strategy or some of what Scott, maybe we should have Scott and a few others who are interested in this nominate or self nominate? Mm, I'll just nominate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, great. Okay. Other thoughts? Yes. I agree with, I mean, I, I, again, I think the idea of thinking about capacity building, Scott's right on point that, you know, training and education for students, and I, I think not just younger students, but also there's 
professional or executive education possibilities here, I think, that are very mm -hmm. real. Um, and, and to think to the point of the people who are actually doing this work every day, they don't have time to go to long classes and stuff. So how do, how do you feed this into the kinds of organizations that are supporting professionals managing partnerships right now? How can we be relevant to them? I think Scott's right, social media and other tools are there. Um, one thought I had is there's a set of people we haven't talked about, at least in this session very much, which is government officials. And I, I do think in particular, uh, it's hard when people are very busy, but to, to make the case that a partnership can be a way to accomplish a public purpose that you have in your government job, um, I think is a message that somebody should send, and and I think uh, it, and it doesn't always work, but it can work, and and public of people in in government agencies can be a really important audience. Yeah, I think you're bringing up a good uh, point, which is that um, first of all, we have to segment the audience and who we are trying to reach with what. With government officials, we have a different goal than with the future workforce and or he frontline healthcare workers or our own employees, right? It's all different goals and different different things that we want to do with them. So segmenting the audience is really important. And then the strategy comes out of that. Brenda, yes. So just, I guess, an observation and maybe what I see is a little bit of a gap. So when we think about what's out there in the public domain, at least from my observation, we, we tend to favor like case studies and literature around more the philanthropic partnerships. So I just want to make sure that when we're thinking about getting information out there, we're not forgetting about more of the... Philanthropic uh, piece, yeah. Well, no, actually, I think the philanthropic piece is, is pretty well covered. But I think what's missing is a lot of information and literature and, you know, how to, how to on more of the um, uh, partnerships that are rooted in business, you know, mm -hmm. whether they're the shared value partnerships with mutually reinforcing social and business value or more of a commercial model. Mm -hmm. So yep. I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of lose those because I that. think those are some great learnings. Yeah. Great. One of the things I want is I want Jim to write a book on, just it doesn't have to be long, on how to get the president to show up, okay? <laughs> That's the most important thing. I mean, of all the things I've seen here, that is the epitome of what you really want uh, when you talk about governments, the president showing up. Um, sorry, Jim. Yeah, so um, building on what Brenda just said and, and listening to some of the other comments, um, I'm with Georgetown University, and the group I work with is called the Global Social Enterprise Initiative, and we sit inside the business school. We do have 75 student leaders, mostly MBA candidates, but also students from some other parts of the university. Um, who take on projects because we're all about helping them apply what they're learning academically in the real world. And we're about harnessing the power of the private sector to solve social problems. So while I can't commit you know, Georgetown University today to doing anything to move this forward, I wanted you to know that we'll happy, I'd be happy to set up some meetings to start talking about um, how we might support this effort if, in fact, you want a university type of partner to help get this going. The presentation at Grand Rounds at Georgetown, so I can I can vouch for the for the program. So, oh yeah, go ahead, Gabriella. And so Brenda's comment made me think about perhaps uh, something on the appropriateness of different forms of uh, collaboration for different types of projects. So, if someone used co-investment and other as another alternative. So. I think there's a spectrum, and it would be good to see if we can have shared understandings on which form of partnership, if you will, will be most productive. Thank you. All right. So, Rachel, um, not to put you in, on the spot, but uh, <laughs> do the academies have a perspective on you know how you sort of get the word out and Anything new you're trying to do? Um, well, what I can share is there's certainly been um, a recognition on the part of the academy is that there's a need for us to think differently about how we're disseminating the information that we we convene and, and the reports that we produce. Um, I think that there's uh, technical audiences and certainly audiences within in the government that we reach very well and effectively with the model that we've had for a long time. 
Um, but there's been a strong recognition here at the institution that um, we need to think differently about our communication channels. The audiences we want to reach have, have changed, um, and the means of communication have changed as well. So what I will share is there is a, a large-scale initiative that's happening to look uh, very strategically at new communications um, tools and, and strategies for the institution overall. I think that, and that'll be a bit of a process that'll be rolled out, but I think that there's things that this forum can think about and certainly putting together a, a work group, a subset of our members to put together a communication strategy for how we might want to think about the different audiences, the messages for those audiences, and the best tools to reach them that we can then work internally to see um, what works within our current parameters and, and how we can push that forward. So hopefully we can push some things out um, through our group in the meantime, and also stay tuned for some, I think, a, a different face of communication you'll see from the academies um, in not, hopefully not too far future. But for today's purposes, if somebody wants to volunteer to be part of that subgroup, who should they reach out to? Me. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Great. At Rachel, right? Um, thanks. Thank you. Um, any last comments? Yes. Um, you know, this type of forum is great in this country, but I think having this forum in maybe like the South or somewhere in, in Africa or other places where we're thinking of working would be very beneficial because I feel like in this, right now, there are very few people from the places that we're trying to work with um, representing and ev even talking about the issues of trust and the cultural barriers, I think will be very helpful and will be more effective that way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and probably in some middle income countries as well, right? Gardens? It's <laughs> good. All right. N any, any, anything else? If not, I think, um, I think we got a lot of great insights. It's been uh, two great days, stimulating discussions, lots of interactions and dialogue. And uh, hopefully, we'll have a new communications plan that broadly disseminates this information. So I want to thank everybody for your engagement, for your participation, and uh, you know, for, for all of the work that went into this from the planning committee. I want to thank the planning committee. And, uh, and Clary, yes, and Clarion and I, you know, co, you know it, it was great for us to also have Rachel and Kathy, Kath, yeah, Please stand, stand up. up. Kate, 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 um, and everybody helping us, um, you know, put this together. That it was really, you know, tremendous. And to our speakers and our panelists and everybody, you know, thank you very much for just a wonderful, wonderful two days. Clarion, anything else you'd like to add? Nothing. And a big applause to Rachel. Yes. Thanks all. Bye bye. Happy Friday. <laughs>